Long before the first white man had set foot on the shores of America, a group of people known as the Chumash lived in an area that is now part of California. The Chumash excelled in ocean navigation, were superb craftsmen in basketry and stone, but are probably best known for hundreds of unusual rock paintings found in the caves of their homeland. Chumash inhabited an area northwest of present-day Los Angeles. The homeland of the Chumash is mountainous country and largely composed of ancient sedimentary rock. Numerous caves and unusual formations have been carved in the soft sandstone outcroppings over countless centuries of erosion by wind, sun, and water. The Chumash lived in close harmony with natural forces. They were principally food gatherers, and the gathering was good, for nature had endowed the Chumash homeland with abundant foodstuffs. Several varieties of oaks filled the valleys and coastal plains, furnishing the acorns that served as the staple food of the Chumash. The acorns were shelled and dried, then ground to the consistency of a coarse flour. Hot water was poured over the ground meal to leach away the bitter tannic acid, and the acorn mush was allowed to harden into a cake, which was cooked before eating. Pine nuts were a favorite food of the Chumash, along with the chia sage, whose oily seed was ground into a flour, making a highly nutritious food. A particularly useful plant was the amole, or soap plant. The root of this common plant was roasted and eaten, providing the Chumash with an important food source. The plant also generated a soapy lather and was used for bathing. But probably the most ingenious way the Chumash used the soap plant was to place the crushed plant in quiet pools. This had the effect of paralyzing trout and thus enabling their easy capture. Swamps and lagoons provided the Chumash with an inexhaustible supply of shellfish and waterfowl. Along the seashore, the abundance of abalone not only provided the Chumash with food, but contributed to their affluence since their shells were used as money by tribes throughout the southwest. When the Santa Barbara Channel was calm enough for navigation, the Chumash would launch their plank canoes and head for the offshore fishing grounds. Smaller fish were taken with hooks and nets, while larger fish were harpooned. The Chumash traveled long distances in their small canoes, making hundred-mile journeys to Santa Catalina Island and ventured out to remote San Nicolas Island, 65 miles from the mainland. Navigating the seas took special courage for the Chumash, 
for they believed that a man who perished by drowning did not go on to a better world in the next life, but was fated to wander forever. A myriad of supernatural entities governed the Shumash universe. Their medicine men believed the world was composed of three elements, wind, earth, and water. They worshipped the sun and the raven, as well as the swordfish, which they believed was responsible for driving whales ashore and thus providing Indian villages with meat. The Shumash made little distinction between the natural and supernatural world. All colors used by the Indians were earth pigments. The best black pigment was produced from hydrous oxide of manganese. White pigment was made from diatomaceous earth. Hematite, a form of iron oxide, provided the Shumash with a red pigment, and yellow was another iron oxide, limonite. The Shumash were very clean people. Every Shumash village had a temescal, or sweat house, which the men entered each day. Here, they would sit around the fire until drenched with perspiration, then jump in a cold pool. They believed this practice made a man age more slowly. Basketry was a highly developed art among the California Indians, and those produced by the Shumash were of superior workmanship and design. Basketry bottles lined with asphaltum were even used to carry water. Life was good to the Shumash and they enjoyed a standard of living considerably higher than many of their California neighbors. But then, in 1542, a Portuguese mariner named Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo sailed into the Santa Barbara Channel in search of a waterway connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. were visited by other early explorers of the 16th century as well, but it wasn't until Father Junipero Serra established the mission system in the late 18th century that the Shumash experienced the full impact of European culture. The Spanish Padres baptized the Indians into Christianity and settled them in quarters next to the mission, where they died by the thousands from the white man's diseases. Those who survived lived in a state of peonage, being let out for work to the Spanish rancheros settling in the area. The hopelessness of their predicament, together with the flogging of an Indian at one of the missions, touched off a revolt among the remaining Shumash in 1824. The Indians fled the mission and tried to escape through the mountains to the interior valley. But the Presidio Cavalry, under the command of Captain Jose de la Guerra, overtook the fugitives and crushed the rebellion, killing a number of Indians in the process. By 1839, less than 250 Shumash were still alive in the Santa Barbara area. During the span of a single lifetime, one of the largest and most culturally advanced Indian nations in California had all but ceased to exist. Although most of the Shumash culture died with the old ones many years ago, the legacy of the Shumash culture continues to live in the caves of their homeland.
The natural inclination of most people first viewing Chumash art is to interpret the designs from the framework of their own culture or personal experience. Yet this approach is never fully adequate for understanding the art and culture of a people far removed from 20th century life. interpretations have been offered by experts to account for the true meaning of the Shumash paintings. It's been said that these paintings do not depict things so much as concepts, concepts of good and bad or supernatural phenomena. The Shumash believed in a supernatural world which was as real and readily visualized as the natural world. Many of the Shumash paintings were probably representations of supernatural beings or forces. The Shumash worshipped the god Sup, or Shupu, as the giver of good things, and was personified by their shamans in several ways. Perhaps many of the anthropomorphic figures found in these paintings were representations of this god, and were painted for use in Shumash rituals. Most of what is known today about the Shumash rock paintings has come out of the extensive work of Campbell Grant, author of the book, The Rock Paintings of the Shumash. A large part of the enjoyment of this kind of aboriginal research is in that the work takes you into many remote and beautiful areas that one would never see without this incentive. Many of the finest examples of rock art are in rough, inaccessible country, and this is true of most of the Chumash work. It mainly is found in steep chaparral areas where chamise, manzanita, and the formidable yucca are characteristic plants. You cannot just take off into the back country, hoping to find a painted cave. Such aimless travel might produce nothing even after years of searching. My explorations have been based on information supplied by anthropologists, forest rangers, ranchers, hunters, and fishermen who may have stumbled onto an Indian rock painting at some time. Usually the clues are slender. A deer hunter saw such a cave 30 years before and cannot quite recall where it was. A rancher saw a painted rock while rounding up cattle. Sometimes a long trip will end up with complete frustration, as when I was guided to a painted panel seven hours by trail in the San Rafael Range, only to find the paintings were iron stains. Let us say that I have located a small cave with a few designs in red and black. Notes are taken on dimensions of painted area, size of shelter, nearest water, elevation, and the like. Color slides are taken with a 35 millimeter camera. Available light is preferred, but flash is often necessary under poor lighted conditions. Later in my studio, the slides are projected onto buff or black paper. It simulates the natural rock coloring of the site. The outlines of the drawings are traced and then painted to closely match the original tones. One Shumash rock art site has recently been made into a state park, painted cave in San Marcos Pass near Santa Barbara. This cave may have at one time been a religious retreat for the population centers around present day Santa Barbara and Galita. The entrance to the cave is blocked by a heavy steel gate to protect the paintings from vandalism. Yet, despite these elaborate security measures, the locks on the steel gate have been sawed through on several different occasions and the paintings have been defaced, clearly acts of premeditated vandalism.
Only a few Shumash rock painting sites have escaped the ravages of erosion and vandalism so as to be of any photographic value today. The noted rock art author Beth Hill once wrote, the petroglyphs are artifacts which have not been removed from their locations to the museums and private collections. For the most part, they remain where they were made, and in this they are unique among artifacts. When you stand in front of them, your feet press the earth where the carver once stood, and you feel the air on your face as he did. And possibly, if you are patient in contemplation, you may begin to know something of his involvement in nature, his worldview from which the image on the stone emerged. In Europe and other parts of the world, rock painting sites are considered national treasures. Measures are taken to preserve the paintings and provide for public access with adequate supervision. In this country, however, little has been done to preserve the legacy of rock art left by our Native Americans. Until these works receive the recognition they deserve, Rock painting sites like Painted Rock in the Carrizo Plains are destined to eventual destruction by erosion or senseless vandalism. The rocks and caves will endure, but these early visions of man's universe will vanish forever. <laughs>